Good evening. I'm William Cooper, and you're listening to The Hour of the Time. The Constitution Party of South Carolina will be having a meeting on April the 20th at 7 p.m. Greenville Public Library at 300 College Street in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, for information, call Mark at 803 eight three four zero nine nine two that's eight zero three eight three four zero nine nine two or you can call Vic at eight zero three six eight four three one five five that's Vic at eight zero three six eight four three one five five also there will be a meeting of the Constitution Party in Missouri on uh, April the 20th at the same time, 7 p.m., at the Kearney branch of the Springfield Green County Public Library in the Public Use Room at 630 West Kearney in Springfield, Missouri. Contact Tom at 417-889-5981. That's Tom at 417-889-5988. Once again, that's the Constitution Party in Missouri, April 20th, 7 p.m., at the Kearney branch of the Springfield Green County Public Library in the Public Use Room, 630 West Kearney in Springfield. Contact Tom at 417-889-5988. On the Conference of the States, we need your help, folks. You've got to be involved in this. If you don't get involved, we can't do it. Remember what we did in Pennsylvania and how it hurt them so bad that they went to the press to try to demonize us. You see, there's one thing that our enemies always do. They ignore us unless we really hurt them, and then they attack us in the press. It's always been that way. So when they attack us in the press, we know that we're doing something right. Don't forget that. Nevada. There are two Conference of the States bills in Nevada that will be going up for a hearing very quickly. That's AB 99 and SB 127. AB 99 and SB 127. As of March Thirtieth, we were told that AB 99 has not been put on the agenda for the Assembly's Ways and Means Committee, and their agenda is set through, well, I don't really know, but you've got time, since it hasn't been set, you've got time to call facts and write to the members of the committee. I'm going to give you their names and phone numbers. SB 127 is due to be heard in the Senate Finance Committee uh, per Senate Rhodes, author of SB 127 staff, and he has not yet decided when to put this on the Finance Committee agenda. And uh, we don't know yet when it's going to come up for a hearing. But call, write, fax. Remember, it's AB 99 and SB 127. Um, to write... Right to the Nevada State Legislative Building, 401 South Carson Street, Carson City, Nevada, 89710. That's the Nevada State Legislative Building, 401 South Carson Street,
Carson City, Nevada, 89710. One time there was a very famous mint there. Faxes for the Assembly and Ways, Assembly Ways and Means members can be sent to 702-687-8207. That's 702-687-8207. And that's for Faxes for the Assembly Ways and Means Committee. For uh, AB99, Assembly Ways and Means members, and all the phone numbers, folks, start with 702 687. All of them start with 702 687. So I'm just going to read you the last four digits. Morse Arberry, Democrat. He's the chair of the committee. 3660. That's 3660. Jan Evans, Democrat, co chair. 3613. That's 3613. Von Chowning, 81. Four six, eight one four six. Joe Dini, three six two six. That's three six two six. Now, if you don't have time to write all these names down, folks, just call these numbers and voice your opinion. Don't worry about the names. Chris Gian Cigliani. <laughs> I know you didn't get that one. Three six one two. That's 3612. Remember, all of these numbers start with 702-687. I'm just reading you the last four digits. Bob Price, 3967. That's 3967. Larry Spittler, 8199. That's Larry Spittler, 8199. John Marvel, who's a chair, 3664. John Marvel, Chair, 3664. Sandra Tiffany, Co-Chair, 3668. Dennis Allard, 3582. That's 3582. Maureen Brower, 3596. 3596. Jack Close, 366. One four, three six one four. Tom Fedick, three five eight four. That's three five eight four. And Lynn Hetrick, three six two eight. That's three six two eight. Now the Nevada's State Finance Committee fax number is seven zero two six eight seven. Five nine six two. That's seven zero two six eight seven five nine six two. And SB one twenty seven will be coming up to the Senate Finance Committee members very shortly. All these phone numbers begin with seven zero two six eight seven. That's seven zero two six eight seven. William Raggio, Chair, eight one eight four. That's eight one eight four. Lawrence Jacobson, 8125. That's 8125. Dean Rhodes, 3648. 3648. Bernice Matthews, 3658. 3658. Raymond Rawson, 8164. 8164. William O'Donnell, 36 Five zero. That's three six five zero. And Bob Coffin, three six four zero. Three six four zero. And I think Bob Coffin is a good name to end it on for Nevada. In Oregon, Oregon is going to reconsider. They're going to reconsider SJR seven, the Conference of the States in the House Rules Committee. It was killed on the House floor on March the 29th. But the Assembly Majority Leader, Ray Baum, is trying to get around the people. His number is 503-986-1400. He decided to change his vote, so it was sent back to the House Rules Committee. That's Ray Baum, 
986-1400. Now, folks, that means we beat it in Oregon, and this guy pulled a slicky on us, and it's going to be reintroduced. It was sent back to the House Rules Committee, and it'll probably come out again for another vote. We must get it killed in this committee now. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, so let's not be messing around. You've got to get on Oregon, and you've got to get on them now. Please call, fax, send letters, do everything that you possibly can. Kill this, SJR 7, at the Conference of the States. Tell them we want this brought up in their committee immediately and killed. Also use uh, any, any means that you can to get to these people. Phone, fax, call, travel there, talk to them personally, go in and visit with them. There's one fax for all these members. Here's the fax number. 503-986-1814. That's 503-986-1814. One eight one four. Put one representative's name on each fax. For letters to each of them, address to the assembly member, Oregon State Capitol, Salem, Oregon, nine seven three one zero. That's the Oregon State Capitol, Salem, Oregon, nine seven three one zero. And here are the names and the numbers of the Assembly Rules Committee. And all of these phone numbers begin with 503-986. That's 503-986. Ray Baum, B-A-U-M. He's the chairman. 1400. 1400. Tony Corcoran. 1444. That's Tony Corcoran, C-O-R-C-O-R-A-N, 1444. Lynn Lundquist, that's Lynn Lundquist, L-U-N-D-Q-U-I-S-T, 1459. That's 1459. Lee Bayer, spelled B-E-Y-E-R, he's the vice chairman. 1442. That's 1442. Remember, all these numbers begin with 503 986. Peter Courtney, spelled C O U R T N E Y, 1990. That's 1990. Bill Markham, M A R K H A M, 1446. That's 1. Four four six. John Watts, W A T T S, one four five zero. That's one four five zero. Lonnie Roberts, Lonnie Roberts, one four two one. That's one four two one. Patty Milne, M I L N E, one four three eight. That's 1438. Folks, we must all continue to work hard to help these states defeat the Conference of the States. Remember, our liberty hangs in the balance. Your calls really do make a difference. Your faxes make a difference. Your letters make a difference. When you appear in person, it really makes a difference. So call, fax, write, visit, all of the above. All of a sudden, in the middle of the night, there's a loud knock on your door. Hey, honey. Something's not right. Hold your arms. Please step out fast. We're here. We're here. We're here. Time from the IRS with a fire attack. Did you die from play? Wait a minute. Get out of this house. Surrender your taxes. Give me your time. You better obey if you want to go home. That's the best I can do for your time.
Hillary Salala, Reno Janet Dyke, reading the words of General Albert Tyson. The money founder of the Ku Klux Klan, engineer of the Masonic Master Plan. I said Lucifer is God across this land. And Clinton's saying, take the mark in your right hand. While we're all dancing to the drums of up Lord right, Clinton's preparing it for another huge attack. Order. Order out of chaos, depression, inflation, creates a panic and rape the nation. Order. Crisis creation. Incite black and white program and education. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I am going to deliver you <laughs> a view of the world that you've never experienced before. I can guarantee you. And this comes right out of the pages of Veritas. This is my editorial for the second issue. Some of you who have the paper, you have read this. But there are many people out there who don't know what's really going on in the world. And so tonight I'm going to give them a sneak peek into the newspaper of the century. World View, an editorial by William Cooper. Nations greeted the fall of the Soviet Union with cheers. The future looked good, minus the threat of atomic war. The evil empire died, or so we thought, while our eyes were on Russia and the Eastern Bloc. Two new threats materialized, the economic power of the socialist European Union and Islamic militarism with its unpredicted alliances. In Europe, geography has always determined history. Austria's accession to the European Union sets Hungary on the border. The EU finds itself sharing a common land border with Russia, now a direct neighbor due to the accession of Finland and Sweden. A new Scandinavian and Baltic dimension to what had been a predominantly Western European formation confronts the European Union with its new challenges to the East. Despite the lack of coverage in the United States, the new power in the world is shaping up to be Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, and the other European nations. In fact, the European Union is already bigger than the United States, with around 360 million people, 100 million more than the United States. The European Union is only $0.5 trillion behind the GDP of the United States, and with further expansion of its membership will soon surpass the $6.4 trillion of the U.S. I predict that a dangerous new alliance is on the horizon, an alliance more threatening to the West than the Soviet Union. With the new world capital of Marxism residing in Brussels and the citizens of Russia pining away for their lost security in communism, a Russian-European alliance is very probable. An alliance with the European Union would solve many of Russia's most pressing problems and would give the European Union somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 million people and a GDP of about $9 trillion. While Americans continue to feel safer because of the touted victory over the evil empire, most are unaware of the great changes taking place. Already, Europe is sucking America dry by refusing to open trade in agricultural and other products. The European Union and the Japanese are protectionist, and this is already crippling America economically while allowing others to grow. An anti-American alliance is taking form. The Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence and Intelligence Service members in Brussels, Rome, London, Moscow, and Zurich report a new European-Russian compact that would destroy the United States economy. An economic military alliance between the European Union and Greater Russia will be the biggest challenge ever faced by the United States. The concentration of power will be the greatest in the history of the world. This combination, 
seeks total domination just as Hitler's Nazi Germany did in the early 40s. Hitler, however, never dreamed of the strength that would be embodied in this European Union-Russian pact. Not too long ago, if you will remember, the world trembled during the attempted, or was it staged, coup against Gorbachev. The uncertainty of who exactly would take his place, coupled with the blared danger of the Soviet Union's nuclear warheads, was enough to worry even the most jaded. Is it time to tremble again? Boris Yeltsin is not going to remain president for long. Who will succeed him? That is one of the most important questions in world politics today. Everyone has heard of Boris Yeltsin, but very few could tell you the name of any other leading political figure in Moscow. The old guard is passing. Some have heard of Vladimir Zhirinovsky, names like Boris Nimtsov, Yegor Gaidar, Alexander Rutskoy, Grigory Yavlinsky, and Boris Fyodorov draw only vacant stares. If you don't believe me, look at the face of the person sitting next to you. How many of you heard those names? Russia's economy demands special attention. It is not as bleak as you have been told. On the contrary, high risk is the norm, but as anywhere else, high risk means high rewards. Car ownership has gone up by 50%. The average monthly salary rose in dollars from $8 in 1992 to $113 in October of 1994. And despite the doomsayers, the Russian people are doing better economically than anyone can remember. Their problems lie in the areas of crime and education, particularly relating to business. Russia's trade with the West is dominated by the European Union. The bulk, however, is still with other former Soviet republics. The European Union's exports to Russia were five times higher than those of the United States, and the imports were about 19 times higher from Russia than the United States. And Russia's central bank granted full license to Citibank, Chase Manhattan, Credit Suisse, ING Bank, ABN AMRO, Societe Generale, Bank of China, Yapi Vecredi, and Bank Austria to compete with Dresdner, BNP, and Credit Lyonnais, who already held licenses for business in St. Petersburg. Chechnya. Chechnya is the Achilles heel in Russia's political and economic arena. The use of military might to solve a political problem is drawing fire from the leaders of the West, Americans in particular. Yeltsin's inability to solve the problem may be his downfall. His orders are sometimes ignored by his commanders. Some units have refused to fight. One general submitted his resignation. It was refused, and he was transferred to a more peaceful post. There must be a solution. And it must come soon. Chechnya is Russia's Kuwait. The main pipeline from the Caspian Sea oil wells comes inland from Makhachkala at the coast to the outskirts of Grozny. It then forks. One pipeline goes west to the Black Sea and the Russian naval base at Novorossik, and the other heads north into Russia. The two east-west railroad lines from Mozdok to Makhachkala, strategically vital to any Russian military presence in the Caucasus, runs through Chechnya, and so do the main roads. Without control of the territory, Russia could no longer sustain its forces or its trade in its least stable border region. And that is why Yeltsin cannot let go of this country. You can look for possible United Nations peacekeeping action in Chechnya, using United States troops. It may sound far out, but if it happens, you could anticipate United Nations peacekeeping in the United States using Russian troops. The wild card 
and all of this seems to be the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal. What of the atomic and hydrogen weapons that were poised for launch against the United States? Who controls them, if anybody? Who is keeping tabs on the components to make the bombs? How do we know they are not being sold to gangbangers in Los Angeles? Some say that the long and short-range weapons, nuclear missiles, and submarines of the old Soviet Union are the greatest threat to the world since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Reports say there are anywhere from zero to as many as 35,000 atomic and hydrogen weapons floating around over there. If they don't exist, which is probable, why were we threatened with them for so many years? If they do exist, and in the larger numbers, are they being sold to the highest bidder in some alley in Casablanca? And how do we find out? And even if they are not, you must remember that Vladimir Zhirinovsky threatened to use Russia's nuclear weapons against Japan, Germany, and America. Don't dismiss this guy as just another nut. He won the 1993 Duma elections. With freedom came the release of repressed ethnic pride and nationalism. And you can expect to see bloody uprisings in Hungary, in Romania, and Slovakia. The Russians throughout the ex-USSR, the Turks in Bulgaria, and those are only a few of the probabilities. And one example, just one, is Yugoslavia, now called Bosnia. Last but not least is the Muslim question. Islamic extremism is a problem in Russia. For example, the Muslim republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan have all been approached by Iran to supply it with ex-Soviet nuclear weapons. The rulers of these ex-Soviet republics know that if they do not do what Iran wants, then they will be swept from power by Iranian-inspired Islamic revolutionaries. And the Middle East is the easiest shot to call. The fires of Islamic extremism throughout the world have been fueled by the collapse of communism. The Ayatollahs are now telling their followers there is only one way forward for Muslims, the Islamic way. And Islamic extremism is ready to knock aside anything and everything that gets in its way whether it is the revolutionaries in Algeria and Libya, the sheiks of Saudi Arabia, or the politicians of Turkey and Pakistan. Even worse, it is spreading into the Western world. I'm not talking about the followers of Muhammad. I'm talking about Islamic extremists, those who would die instantly to further their cause and take a million people with them if they can. There's a big difference between peaceful worshipers and these people. And ladies and gentlemen, they are very, very dangerous. For example, I cite the Muslims of Bradford and other cities in Britain to the Algerians in every city in France which was the exile home of Khomeini to Germany, Canada, and America. The Islamic madness is thinly disguised nihilism, hell-bent on destroying every last vestige of Western civilization. And really scary, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that Islam is now being armed with nuclear technology by China and Russia. They are negotiating to buy ex-Soviet nuclear weapons and scientists. Over one million ex-Soviet nuclear weapons scientists and technicians are looking for jobs outside Russia. And they're finding that Islam pays very well. Gaddafi just recently offered the top Russian atomic specialists, who traditionally earned $9 a month, $10,000 a month, to come work for him. Do you really think they will turn Colonel Gaddafi down? I don't think so. I think they will soon be making atomic bombs for Islam with the express purpose of launching a nuclear assault on Israel before the year 2000. And don't believe in these peace talks. They will fall apart and the rift will be over Jerusalem. 
And when it happens, the Israelis will annex the West Bank. I'm sure you can put the rest of this puzzle together. Islam intends to destroy Israel before the end of the century. The Islamic extremists will have their traditional ally, Russia, helping them. You won't hear this on the 6 o'clock news, but Russia is hedging her bets, making an alliance with the European Union and also with the Islamic nations under the table. Russia and Islam, in alliance with the South African ANC, have planned a strategic raw materials blockade against the West. Russia and Kazakhstan have applied to join OPEC, and you won't hear that on the 6 o'clock news either. This will give OPEC over 50% of the world's oil production and over 80% of the world's known oil reserves. Vital raw materials such as chromium are virtually monopolized by South Africa. The ANC will link up with the Islamic Arab Empire to control all of the continent. Our sources tell us that the ANC is moving all its bank accounts to the Islamic Bank. If they can pull this off, the West... Will this happen? If the past, ladies and gentlemen, is a window up on the future, the answer... The answer, ladies and gentlemen, is yes. We need American to rebuild America and don't take us back to where we were, but to where we should have been. All for the people who've been long forgotten. And just ignore the end. Try with our American pride. We need American pride to rebuild America. And we're working hard for the same. Yes, some of us are working hard. Most of us are sitting back on the couch waiting for everybody else to do it for them. Those who are wise are preparing for what is sure to come. Have you been watching the dollar decline lately? You have, really? How can that be? You see, the dollar is nothing but a measurement of a specific weight of gold and silver coin. But there is no gold and silver coin. How can this measurement decline? A dollar can no more decline, ladies and gentlemen, Then a quart can be poured into a glass. You see, a quart can be a measurement of milk. And the milk can be poured into a glass. And you can drink that glass of milk, and the milk will disappear. But you cannot make a quart disappear. Maybe that's a little bit over some people's heads. I don't know. But to me, it's just as crystal clear as this light bulb about two feet from my eyes. The Hour of the Time is sponsored by Swiss America Trading, and they specialize in real money. In the law, money is defined as gold and silver coin. In the Constitution, it says that only Congress has the power to coin money. It doesn't say print money. It says coin money. It says that no state shall tender in payment of date debt anything other than gold or silver coin. And I keep telling you the Constitution is not in effect, and you keep telling me that I'm wrong. If I am wrong, why are there no gold and silver coins? You've been scammed. You've been fooled. You've been lied to. And some of you are smart enough to figure it out. Others are not. For those of you who are, you'd better get your hands on some real money because soon this is all going to come tumbling down. And when it does, God help you if you are not prepared. So call Swiss America Trading, 1-800-289-2646 and do it right now. You know how 
we all tend to procrastinate. Call 1-800-289-2646. Ask them how you can get your hands on some real money. Not paper, not counterfeit, not instruments of debt, not notes, but money. Do you know why you have a certificate of title for your automobile instead of the actual title to the car? It's because you paid for it with an instrument of debt, which means you haven't paid for it at all. And someday the true owners are going to come for all the property that you think you own. That's why you hold a warrant deed to your house and not a patent allodial title. And I'll bet you most of you don't even know what I'm talking about. Call Swiss America Trading, 1-800-289-2646. You'll be glad that you did. With our American pride, we need American pride to rebuild America. So reach out your hand to help someone and learn to understand them. For we as a nation can make the fine together rebuild again. Pride, we sure American pride. We need American pride to rebuild American pride. Are you American pride? Be an American pride. Well, I hope the Wicked Witch of the San Joaquin Valley is listening because tonight I'm going to give her some documentation. What do you want to bet she's not listening? What do you want to bet she's out partying because she doesn't care? Because most people don't care. There is an awakening in this country, ladies and gentlemen. I can remember when I first began my task, as I call it now. I had to travel a thousand miles to get three people in somebody's living room to listen to me if I could even get three people to listen to me. And that was as recent as 1988. And I had to pay for everything. And I mean everything. Now, if I go to places like Salt Lake City, People come and fill the salt dome. When I go to Atlanta, the hall where I speak is packed with standing room only and usually a large crowd standing around the walls and in the back. So there is an awakening, and we are putting pressure upon those who would enslave us. But how did all this begin? Well, we gave you a good dose of the history in issue number one of Veritas, which is a co-sponsor of this broadcast. Issue number two, people said, was much better than the first. And the first was staggering in its content. Issue number three is going to leave you gasping for breath. And tonight, I'm just going to give you a little taste of what you might find in issue number three of Veritas. And I suggest you listen very carefully. When did all this begin to materialize as something that you could see if you were watching? How about August 14th, 1941? August 14th, 1941, the Atlantic Charter was signed. And it was a statement of principles to govern the establishment of a worldwide system of security. And from the signing of that document, the Atlantic Charter, on August 14, 1941, the Allied forces in Europe were called the United Nations. How about January the 1st, 1942? a formal declaration by the United Nations 
It was a statement supporting the Atlantic Charter signed by 26 nations. And you all thought that the United Nations didn't exist until 1945, didn't you? How about October the 30th, 1943, the Moscow Declaration, which none of you ever heard of, which called for and agreed on the necessity for an international organization. This organization was agreed upon by China, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States. The Cold War was a total scam. You've all been hoodwinked. <laughs> and I didn't coin that phrase. How about May 1st through the 17th, 1944? For the Commonwealth Prime Minister's meeting, where they reached an agreement that the United Kingdom should discuss plans for an international organization with signers of the Moscow Declaration. And October 9th, 1944, Dumbarton Oaks proposals, where they made a recommendation concerning the establishment of an international organization. August 21st to September 29th, the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and United States negotiated. And in September 29th to October 7th, China, the United Kingdom, and the United States negotiated. And from November 1st through the 6th, 1944, they held the Wellington Conference. Australia and New Zealand approved 12 resolutions on a general international organization. And all the while, you were asleep, thinking that your politicians were acting in your best interest. But they were acting in concert to destroy the sovereignty of nation states, including the United States of America, entering into agreements and treaties to disarm all peoples and nations of the world and create a one world government. How about January 30th through February the 2nd, 1945, the Malta Conference, where the United Kingdom and the United States had meetings prior to the Yalta Conference. And at Yalta, February 4th through the 11th of the same year, the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and United States agreed on the Security Council voting formula and the structure that would take shape as the United Nations, the government of the world. They also agreed upon the form that the Cold War would take to suck the money out of the populations of the various major nation states of the world in order to finance the technology to enslave the masses. From February 21st through March 8th, they held the Inter-American Conference on Problems of War and Peace. The American republics, except for Argentina, met and agreed that Dumbarton Oaks' proposals constituted the basis for an organization. And they did this in Mexico City. April 4th through the 13th, there was a British Commonwealth meeting. And they agreed that Dumbarton Oaks' proposals provided the base for an organization of world government. April 9th through the 20th, there was a committee of jurists Jurists from 44 nations, including the United States, the American Bar Association, drafted statutes for an international court of justice. April 9th through June 25th, 1945, the United Nations Conference on International Organization and representatives from 50 nations drafted the Charter and the Security Council. And a statement by the delegations of the four sponsoring governments on voting procedures in the Security Council was released to the public. June 26th, the Charter was signed by representatives of 50 nations. And on June 27th, the Preparatory Commission of the United Nations had its first meeting. July 6th, the Charter had its first ratification by the nation of Nicaragua. August 6th, Hiroshima. August 8th, 
the Charter made the deposit of the first ratification by the United States. On August 16th through November 24th, the Preparatory Commission meetings of the Executive Committee took place. October the 24th, the Charter came into force with the deposit of the Soviet Union instrument of ratification. November 15th, Atomic Energy, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the United States agreed on establishment of the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission. November 24th through the December the 23rd, they held the second session of the Preparatory Commission. December 16th through the 26th of that same year, Atomic Energy, the Council of Foreign Ministers of the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States agreed on establishment of the United Nations Commission on Atomic Energy. The reason the atomic bomb was really dropped on Japan was not to shorten the war, but to frighten the world into accepting the United Nations as a world governmental body to keep the peace amongst nations. Regardless of what the truth was of the death camps in Europe, or how many of who or what peoples died, the Holocaust was widely promoted as the most horrible genocide in the history of the world in order to encourage the peoples of the world to come together under the United Nations and in the headlines of all the countries of the world, the United Nations was touted as the answer to war. In 1946, January 10th through February the 14th, the General Assembly's first session, Part 1, convened. January 17th of 1946, the Security Council convened its first meeting. On January the 19th, the first dispute was brought to the Security Council and the presence of Soviet troops in Iran was the topic. January 21st, the presence of British troops was brought to the Security Council by the Soviet Union as an irritation in Greece. January 21st, the presence of British troops was brought to the Security Council by the Ukraine as an irritation in Indonesia. January 23rd through February the 18th, the Economic and Social Council had its first meeting. January 24th, the Atomic Energy Establishment of the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission by the General Assembly was adopted. January 25th, Albania applied for membership. February the 1st, the Secretary General Trigiv Lee was appointed as the first head of the world government. February the 4th, the Military Staff Committee conducted its first meeting. And during this time, it was decided that the head of the military and all military engagements or police actions conducted by the United Nations would be headed by a general of the Army of the Soviet Union. And every single one of those people over the years has been a general of the Army of the Soviet Union and now Russia. February the 4th, the presence of French-British troops was brought to the Security Council by Syria and Lebanon as an irritation to those two nations. February 6th, the first judges of the International Court of Justice were elected and the International Court was established. February the 9th, the Secretary General requested by the General Assembly to include in his annual report summaries of information received on the non-self-governing territories. February the 14th, 
New York was chosen by the General Assembly as the interim headquarters of the United Nations. February the 16, 1946, the Economic and Social Council established Commission on Narcotic Drugs. Also on that date, the Economic and Social Council established a Commission on Human Rights. On that date also, the Economic and Social Council established Economic and Employment Commission. And the Economic and Social Council established a Temporary Social Commission. They also established a Statistical Commission. And the Economic and Social Council established Temporary Transport and Communication Commission. The first veto in the Security Council took place by the Soviet Union over the Syria-Lebanon question. March 21st, temporary headquarters was established at Hunter College in New York City. April 3rd, the first meeting of the International Court of Justice took place. April 8th, the situation in Spain is brought to the Security Council by Poland. April 8th through the 18th, the process of dissolving the League of Nations took place, and the United Nations became the only and supreme world governing body. From May 25th to June 21st, the Economic and Social Council's second session was convened. June the 14th, the International Atomic Development Authority proposed to the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission that it be established by the United States. It was called the Baruch Plan. On June 18th, the second veto took place in the Security Council, and this veto again was by the Soviet Union. It was over the endorsement of certain principles regarding Spain. The third veto also took place and was delivered by the Soviet Union over recommendations to the General Assembly by the Security Council on the Spanish problem. Again, the subject was Spain. And the fourth veto, again, Spain. And the fifth veto, again, Spain. All of them, one through five, by the Soviet Union. On June 19th, the Convention to Outlaw Production and Use of Atomic Weapons was proposed to the United Nations Atomic Energy Commission by the Soviet Union. You didn't know that, did you? June 19th through July 22nd, the Constitution for World Health Organization was drafted by the United Nations International Health Conference. June 21st, the Subcommission on Freedom of Information authorized by the Economic and Social Council. And the Commission on the Status of Women was established by the Economic and Social Council. Subcommission on Devastated Areas was established by the Economic and Social Council. And the Consultative Status was established by the Economic and Social Council on Non-Governmental Organizations. June 24th, the Mongolian People's Republic applied for membership. On June 26th, the subject, again, Spain, a proposal for simultaneous discussion by the General Assembly on the problem in Spain, received its sixth veto by the Soviet Union. And again, that same day, June 26th, the seventh veto by the Soviet Union on retention of the item on the Security Council agenda. And so Spain left the agenda. July 2nd, Afghanistan applied for membership. July 8th, Jordan applied for membership. July 29th through September the 13th, the first session of the temporary subcommission on the economic reconstruction of devastated areas convened. On August 1st, 1946, all of the property and assets of the League of Nations was transferred to the United Nations. On August 2nd, Iceland, Ireland, and Portugal applied for membership. On August 5th, 
Thailand applied for membership. On August 9th, Sweden applied for membership. On August 16th through the 19th, the headquarters of the United Nations was moved to Lake Success, New York. August 24th, the situation in Greece created by Balkan policy of Greek government was brought to the Security Council by the Ukraine. August 29th, the Security Council voted on the applications of Jordan, Ireland, and Portugal for membership. The 8th to the 10th vetoes were delivered by the Soviet Union. September the 11th through October the 3rd, the Economic and Social Council conducted its third session. September the 20th, the Security Council established a commission of investigation into the subject of Greece. And the 11th veto was delivered by the Soviet Union. September the 21st, the establishment of specialized agencies of administrative committees on coordination. September the 26th, the Scientific and Technical Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission reported no scientific evidence that effective control was not possible of atomic energy. October 1st, the Economic and Social Council established the Fiscal Commission. October 3rd, the Economic and Social Council established the Population Commission. October 23rd through December the 15th, the General Assembly convened the second part of its first session. And on November 19th, Afghanistan, Iceland, and Sweden were admitted as the 52nd, 53rd, and 54th members of the United Nations. And on November 19th also, the transfer of the League of Nations functions was approved by the General Assembly. Good night. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that your eyes are beginning to open. And I hope that you can sleep tonight. And God bless you all. <laughs> Never in human history has so few taken so much from so many as America's Illuminati and their warlords of Wall Street and Washington. In just eight years, these gangsters and international government gangsters took us from the greatest creditor nation to the largest debtor nation on earth. Our standard of living has dropped like a rock for four out of every five Americans. They have foreclosed on our homes, our farms, our factories. They've exported your jobs and surrendered our arms. A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. A new world order. The Illuminati wants you to be a slave from birth to grave. The banks you own the Federal Reserve is private. They own it. It's neither Federal nor a reserve. The cashes make that be a funny money stuff you call dollars for two pennies. They lend it back to us at full face value. Then charge you interest, you get the debt. They get the interest. They get the gold, you get the share. A new world order. A new world order. 